but all that inference would be good. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Asia Pacific War. Uh, as always, my first request will be please turn off your cell phones. Okay, I might as well just make a sign, you know, it'll probably be just easier. But anyway, so far in this class, we have been basically going in a chronological order. So that has been our what we've been doing. We've been going chronologically. I decided that this piece was so important for what occurred during the war that in that it would be wise at this point to talk about this because it has such a huge effect on what's going to go on. So rather than being chronological today, we're going to take this from the beginning of the war to basically the end of the war. And it, it's, you know, those of you that know me, like, you know, I'm pretty into the technology aspects of, of the military. So again, but we're going to try to keep this in the framework of this overall class. So the idea of this class today is USC and air power blockade Japan, which is a, a pretty good sized topic. But I wanted to actually throw something else in here that is very rarely talked about. And that is going to be not just air power and submarines, but it's going to be Japanese submarines. I thought, you know, who talks about Japanese submarines? So let's talk about that today to start out. And what we see with the Japanese submarines is there's a significantly different idea than what the United States will end up doing. But originally in the war, they really had the same plan. But the Japanese had a, a, a different way to make this a reality. And what they would do is they wanted to incorporate aircraft into their submarines. Indeed, the most common class of submarines was the uh, B-1 or the I-15. They made approximately 20 of those, and they all carried aircraft. They made a total during World War II of 32 submarines that carried aircraft, including the I-400 class at the end of the war, which had a very, very large hangar, could carry two very, very fast, well-armed, uh, basically level bombers that could be used perhaps to destroy uh, the Panama Canal. That was one of the thoughts. The other thought was that they would perhaps use it to drop biological weapons on the United States, but the emperor said, no, we aren't going to do that. But indeed, they did make a lot of submarines that carried aircraft. Well, so let's just talk about the most common type, which was this one. And it's got a really long range because it's in the Pacific. It has, uh, a, a, I believe it had uh, eight torpedo tubes, uh, six in the front and two in the rear. Uh, it, it doesn't dive really fast, so it's not really defensible. It's always a good idea if there's an enemy coming with a submarine, you dive as quick as you can. These didn't dive particularly fast. They didn't dive particularly deep. So... When we look at how they were structured, though, if you look at the big arrow, you can see that that is where the aircraft hangar was. And they'd open up the hatch. They'd take this little float plane out. They would assemble it. took about 15 minutes. Then they'd put it on a catapult and launch that thing. Now, that little airplane had a range of over 500 miles. So you can see that as a reconnaissance weapon, this is quite good. It's uh, basically... You know, you can see a lot more, but if you got a plane up in the air, if you're looking for the enemy. Now, again, the Japanese submarines were designed basically to do recon and to sink enemy warships. The Japanese always wanted to sink warships. They were never really focused heavily like we were on sinking cargo ships, though they did sink a significant amount. I don't want to shortchange them there. But the fact is that... I'll give you a really great example. So when there's the Battle of Midway, what the Japanese did was they had sent a group of submarines to be stationed between Hawaii and Midway Island. And the idea was is that they would make sure that they saw when the U.S. fleet of carriers was coming to defend Midway. Well, because of our code breaking, our carriers had already gotten past that submarine screen before it was set up. So the Japanese missed an opportunity, but they were extremely confident that they would see us 
because of submarines like this and their aircraft. So you can see why that would have been a, something they really wanted to do. Well, this particular submarine does serve the Japanese well. It does, uh, for example, sink the uh, USS Wasp. But again, it's a really different idea than what we would do with submarines. Well, how did they recover the airplane? It would land on the water and they hoist it back up. Yeah, they'd rev a crane and pick it up. And then they disassemble it and put it back in a hold. Well, this submarine did launch the only attack on the contiguous United States uh, by Japanese <laughs> aircraft, or by any aircraft, actually, to this day. So they had one of these little planes off the coast of Oregon. You could see that. And uh, the pilot was a man named Fujita. And Mr. Fujita had... This plane isn't a bomber. It's a recon aircraft. So it had two little bitty bombs on it, 168-pound bombs. And what the idea of these were is they were incendiaries. So the idea was to fly it over the forests in Oregon and drop these incendiaries and start forest fires. Well, today you realize that that's not a bad plan because there's a lot of forest fires. And if you only got two little bombs, it's there's not much you can do with them. So it's kind of a good idea, uh, really. The Japanese had a reasonable plan. The problem is uh, when he drops these bombs uh, by Brookings, Oregon, by the way, uh, it had rained the day before. So it doesn't start a big fire. Now, there's a they call this the lookout air raids because there's a fire lookouts. And one of the fire lookout guys saw the airplane and he didn't really know what it was. But then all of a sudden he sees a plume of smoke coming up out of the forest so he goes calls in and goes running over there and starts trying to put this fire out and then another guy that comes running in that same day and they spend the entire night trying to put this fire out then the next day a crew comes in and they do put it out so actually it did manage to almost start a forest fire the second bomb has never been found so did it was it a dud did it hit somewhere where it was so wet that it didn't ignite a fire nobody knows but what i think is kind of interesting too with this story is that after the war fujita goes back to brookings and he presents his family's 400 year old samurai sword to the town which you can still see today i believe it's in the library and he goes back frequently so much so that you know he's trying to basically do goodwill and he is made an honorary citizen of the town he is uh, recognized by President Ronald Reagan for his efforts to be goodwill between the United States and Japan. And I think it's kind of actually a good story. And he passed away, I believe, in 1997. The next year, his daughter came to Brookings and scattered some of his ashes uh, near the, the bomb site. So it's one of those kind of actually nicer stories you would hear from one of my classes. Yes, Alan. Earlier ties to the U.S. Uh, did he have any earlier ties to the U.S. Is the question. Uh, my suspicion is no. I don't know that though for a fact. But uh, he he did feel bad about it. Well, those of you who know me know that I'm big on torpedoes, and uh, the fact is that the Japanese, of course, had the best torpedoes in the world, and they created a type. 93, which we refer to as the Long Lance, which I've mentioned numerous times in this class. And the Long Lance is a really big torpedo. It's 23 inches in diameter. It's uh, really big. It's really heavy. It's got an over a thousand pound warhead and it's only fired from ships. Now, what makes the Long Lance so great is instead of using air to fuel the engine, they use pure oxygen as an oxidizer, which is five times more effective. It's got other problems, and a lot of navies never use this because of those, but the Japanese felt confident that they could overcome this, and they do, really. Um, the thing with this torpedo, though, is because it's so powerful, and it also has incredibly long range, it doesn't have air in its tanks, so it doesn't leave nitrogen bubbles. So it doesn't have a lot of track when, it, when you fire it to lead back towards the submarine, or excuse me, the, the ship. But the Japanese say, well, this is such a great torpedo, but it's way too big for a submarine. Let's make one that'll fit on a submarine. So they make one 
the Type 95 pictured here, and that is a 21-inch diameter torpedo, but it still carries a really big warhead, and they actually make it bigger as the war goes on. It is really fast. It's the fastest torpedo used in World War II until right at the end when we make a hydrogen peroxide torpedo, but very limited use. Uh, it has incredibly long range. This torpedo from fire from a submarine will has a range of almost seven and a half miles. So that's a huge advantage. Plus, it doesn't leave a lot of wake. And for example, in that regard, the Mark 14 torpedo, the United States version of a submarine torpedo, this thing has three times the range. So it's got a huge warhead. It's really fast. And it's got really long range, and it doesn't leave a lot of bubbles. That is a really good torpedo. Well, that torpedo will be used pretty effectively um, because, quite honestly, the Japanese have a, a really stick to their plans. Um, they don't really want to use submarines to attack merchant ships. They really think that submarines need to be used to attack warships. Well, attacking warships is a problem because, first of all, warships are generally armored, so they're less susceptible to damage. They're faster, so they're much harder to hit. And, by the way, they have anti-submarine capabilities, so it's harder to get near them. So, again, it's always a problem, but the Japanese always wanted to, like I've talked to you before, they wanted to whittle down the U.S. fleet as it approaches Japan as part of their plan to win World War II. Uh, which, and then there's going to be a giant naval battle between battleships called uh, Kantai Kessen. But that's their goal. They don't really change from that very much. And so, but they did achieve a lot of successes, particularly in 1942. So, for example, uh, off of Hawaii uh, in January of 42, uh, a Japanese submarine puts a torpedo into the USS Saratoga, and the Saratoga is then basically out of the war for a few months. It manages to limp into Pearl Harbor. On August 31st, remember when the Battle of Guadalcanal is going on, the Saratoga is torpedoed again. And so, again, it's out of the war. It can't fight at, at that. And remember, they do send their group of aircraft to Guadalcanal, to Henderson Field. So, indeed, that certainly helps Henderson Field survive. But, again, a major U.S. warship is knocked out for the second time in the war. Well, also, what's going to happen is perhaps what I think is the greatest torpedo spread ever fired in World War II is fired by the I-19. The I-19 fires six torpedoes at the USS Wasp. Three of those torpedoes hit the Wasp. As you can see in this picture, the Wasp is a mass of flames. It's, it's going to sink relatively rapidly. But that same spread of torpedoes, one of them goes past the uh, Wasp and hits the destroyer USS O'Brien, which will sink later. And another one of those torpedoes goes and hits the uh, battleship North Carolina. And then the North Carolina is out of the war. So in one spread of torpedoes, this, this submarine took out three ships. And again, this is right when Guadalcanal is going on. When we, the Marines are hanging on by a thread. And this submarine causes all this damage. And I think this next picture is really illustrates this point. So if you look at the red circle, that's the horn or the wasp. And the wasp is blowing up. But you can see right what they caught at this picture is that the torpedo hits the O'Brien. Now look at the distance of that. That's really a long way, and it's a pretty amazing photograph. So the, the wasp burning in the background, and of course then the O'Brien being hit by a torpedo, and of course another one will hit the uh, North Carolina. So amazingly effective uh, spread of torpedoes. Well, they have other successes at the same time. For example, uh, the right off again, Guadalcanal, uh, a Japanese submarine sinks the cruiser Junio, of which the uh, there are the five Sullivan brothers. Perhaps you've heard of them. Uh, they are all killed on board the submarine or on the cruiser. And at that point, the U.S. Navy makes a decision that they are no longer going to allow groups of brothers to serve on the same ship because basically all their children in this family are wiped out. Another famous one is off Tarawa is the uh, escort carrier, 
Liscombe Bay. Liscombe Bay is hit by a submarine. It basically blows up. And on board the Liscombe Bay is a gentleman named Doris Miller. And Doris Miller is an African-American. At this time, he's actually a uh, cook. But originally, he's a mess mate at Pearl Harbor uh, on the West Virginia. And when the Japanese are attacking Pearl Harbor, he mans a machine gun himself without really knowing how to run this thing and, and shoots down at least one Japanese aircraft. Some people say four, probably not. But still, he helps evacuate wounded and he gets the navy cross for his efforts at pearl harbor and is very famous amongst the african-american community so in fact our latest ford aircraft carrier will be named the doris miller after after him so uh again killed by a japanese submarine yes wouldn't the submarine be when it's doing this kind of thing? It'd be on the other side of the uh, wasp. About how far? It could be 1,000 yards. Could be closer, could be further. You know, there's no way to really know. They, they never sighted it. Oh, no. It just happened. So um, I would say that's generally the distance, 1,000 yards. Yes? Uh, question, how would the Japanese torpedoes fuse? How, how, what, what made them detonate? How oh, was they were contact. The, the question was, for those of you in Zoom land, is how did our, the Japanese torpedo detonate and they had a contact fuse? So the Japanese submarines will indeed attack merchant ships. So during the war, not just U.S. merchant ships, but British and Dutch particularly, they will sink 184 ships for about 1 million gross registered tons. So it's not like they didn't attack merchant ships. But after the first two years of the war, something happens to the Japanese submarine fleet. And what we begin to do is we begin to bypass islands. For example, Rabaul, which we've talked about and we will talk about again, uh, is bypassed. And they bypass Truck Atoll. And they bypass, we bypass Wake Island. And all these Japanese soldiers and air people that are on these islands are getting no supplies. So they will actually begin to use their submarine fleet as supply ships. So much so that indeed the Japanese army begins to build its own submarines, which is probably not the best use of uh, <laughs> forces, but indeed that's what they do. In fact, at, for example, at Wake Island, uh, by the end of the war, these guys are literally starving to death. Uh, they're they're trying to just they're basically living off of fish. At Rabal, a lot of the soldiers begin to become farmers, and they begin farming so they can supply food to themselves. So the Japanese have tremendous amounts of logistics problems, which we're going to talk about a lot in this class. But a couple of other major pieces is at the end of the war, the Japanese are going to try to create a what they call a toko or toko tai weapon, which is special attack which we use a pejorative term called kamikaze. And they will take that big long lance torpedo and turn it into a manned suicide torpedo. Now, again, it's too big to put inside a submarine. So they will literally take that uh, aircraft hangar off these submarines and strap these big giant chitons onto the deck. And right at the end of the war, the I-58 is on a mission uh, to use its chitons. And they come across the uh, USS uh, uh, Indianapolis. And the chiton pilots want to attack the Indianapolis. And the captain, whose name is Hashimoto, he says, no, no, I don't need you guys. We're going to save you guys for something better. But I can take out the Indianapolis. And he fires a spread of four torpedoes. He gets two hits. The Indianapolis sinks. An extremely famous event. Uh, there's numerous books about this because of the fact that the Indianapolis is not known to be lost for days. In fact, it's not realized that it's lost until an aircraft flies over and sees some of the survivors in the water. And, of course, the survivors are subject to shark attacks. Uh, it's a terrible event. 
So much so that it's even mentioned in the movie Jaws, they mention about the shark attacks in on the Indianapolis. And that happens just two weeks before the surrender. So that's the last U.S. major warship sunk in World War II. And again, it's sunk by a Japanese submarine. So the Japanese submarines have some good effects in World War II, are pretty effective for what they tried to use it for. Well, let's talk about War Plan Orange. And War Plan Orange, as we mentioned, was first developed approximately 1906. Uh, in 1911, it's the first version is actually completed, and it's a plan to, for the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army to fight the Japanese. They have a plan called uh, War Plan Black, for example, that's to fight the Germans, and we actually have a war plan to fight uh, the uh, the British. <laughs> So, uh, so they have a lot of various war plans. Well, the war plan orange, uh, at this time, it's really about the fact that they're going to take our fleet. So the goal is really here. So first they're going to, Japanese will most likely attack the Philippines and they will attack uh, Guam. And the hope is that the Philippines and Guam can hold out. And will take us about six months to gather the fleet the fleet will then fight its way across the Pacific Ocean and will then relieve the Philippines and Guam. And then and from that point on, they will begin a blockade of Japan to win the theoretical war against the Japanese. That's the plan. Well, of course, when this plan is developed and even numerous versions afterwards, they don't really incorporate a lot of modern technology. For example, they never see that air power is going to be a huge advantage. They don't really see that the submarine is going to be a, a big difference maker. But this plan will continue to evolve. One of the key things that does come from this plan is that the Marine Corps develops the capability to land on islands and capture them because it's going to be important to always have bases as you move forward. But at this time, the idea is not for air power. The idea is that the bases will be used for if you have a damaged ship, or if you need to resupply a ship, it will be important to have bases as you continue to move across the Pacific. Well, that's going to change in World War II because well, war plan is going to be modified. And part of the modifications are going to be, of course, for aircraft. So now, instead of using just these islands for bases to repair ships, or even back in the day to use coal to power them, now they're going to use aircraft, and the aircraft will they'll try to capture islands that are in range of the next target. So that way they have land-based air power to support the Navy as they begin to capture more and more islands as they move across the Pacific. Well, of course, this is key. And as the war goes on, the Navy has a plan. And what they want to do is they want to capture Formosa. They want to capture Okinawa, and they want to land on the Jap on the Chinese mainland, and that way they can blockade Japan. They do not want to invade the Philippines. That's going to be not not going to happen. Well, MacArthur, and we're going to talk about this in much more detail. MacArthur is totally against this because there's always this friction between the United States Army and the United States Army Air Force and the Navy. This is always going to be this, this conflict, as we've talked about a little bit. But actually, MacArthur is going to win this political fight, as it turns out to be, and we will attack the Philippines. We will not attack Formosa or land on the Chinese mainland. Well, as always, up until the very end of the war, the goal of the United States Navy is to blockade Japan. That's the way they intend to win the war. They do not intend, and they actually resist efforts to try to invade the Japanese home islands. Well, the Japanese going to remember it's an island. You know, it's island country. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources, and the Japanese need a minimum of six million tons to supply their industry. Well. At the start, they actually have a small excess capacity, about 6.3 million tons they have. So, But they they can never build enough stuff to replace losses. They will replace losses, but they 
don't have the economic capability that we have. For a quick example, when we talk about U.S. building ships, we build during World War II 5,000 cargo ships. So we start World War II with about 8.2 million tons of shipping. Now, we have a lot of losses, particularly to the Germans and to the Japanese as well. And by the end of World War II, we have 41 million tons of shipping. Okay, <laughs> it's pretty amazing, really, that they can uh, we can replace these losses and actually grow our fleet by that kind of a number. Well, we have a really cautious pre-war doctrine. We could see the developments of England. Uh, we can see our own developments in anti-submarine warfare. And the United States Navy becomes extremely cautious about how they're going to conduct naval warfare with submarines. And they cut to the point where it's so cautious that they have war games. And when they have a war game, if I'm a submarine commander and I raise my periscope to attack, and my periscope is seen by one of the other ships that are playing the game, one of the you know enemy ships in the game, I'm automatically ruled by the umpires as destroyed. So just spotting my periscope means I'm out of the game. So it becomes they become so cautious that what they've become a, a doctrine of actually not using their periscopes and you're underwater and you can hear that there's ships out there and they're actually trying to fire torpedoes by hydrophone. Now, realize that today that wouldn't be such a bad plan because torpedoes are smart weapons. But in this day, you fire a torpedo, it just kind of goes where you fired it. So it's not going to track. Uh, actually, we do develop at the end of the war uh, some air-launched uh, submarine torpedo, anti-submarine torpedoes that can track a submarine underwater, but very limited. And the Germans develop a torpedo that's designed to destroy U.S. destroyers. But Right. Yes. Now, I've always heard that uh, at the start of the war, our torpedoes didn't go where we aimed them. That they they didn't hit anything. We're going to talk about that in depth. Give me a minute, okay? Because you know I love torpedoes. So, all right. So again, firing by hydrophones. This is a bad idea. All right. And so U.S. submarine captains, because of this training, because of their war games become really timid. They're really afraid to, to use a submarine perhaps the way the Germans are using it, okay, which is get in close at night, stay on the surface, and use the, use the submarine more like a torpedo boat than using it like a submarine. Remember, when submarines are underwater, they're really slow. When they're on the surface, they're faster than a cargo ship by a significant amount. So they're much more maneuverable, much faster. So if you can use it on the surface, it's a much it's a ship. It's not a submarine, which is really slow. So our captains become incredibly timid. Well, another issue is, is we see before World War II that submarines should be used much in the Japanese method. And that they're going to be the eyes of the fleet. They're going to be used to attack individual uh, warships. And... That's really the kind of doctrine the Japanese are going to continue to have throughout the war. Well, what happens is, is we've seen what the Germans are capable of. We Remember, we went to war in World War I primarily because of uh, Germans using what's known as unrestricted warfare, which is to sink merchant ships without warning, to sink merchant ships without letting the crews uh, get into lifeboats, and... Interestingly, six hours after Pearl Harbor, and it's not U.S. doctrine, Admiral Stark, who's head of the Navy at that particular time, says, well, we're going to do unrestricted warfare. And guess what? Well, we'll tell, the, you know, we don't need to really tell the government at this point. Now, the government will agree to this afterwards. But I mean, on basically his own authority, he launches unrestricted warfare. It's a problem with this, though. Our... Navy is not been trained to do unrestricted submarine warfare. So there's no doctrine of how to handle this, what you should be doing. It's totally different than what the Germans are capable of. So because of this lack of doctrine, our submarines are going to be less effective than they perhaps they would have been. 
But again, it's always these problems that you don't have the proper training, you don't have things structured to do things when you just make these decisions out of the blue. Well, again, we've seen the potential of the Germans. You know, we know what they could do, and we're going to try to do the same thing. And we had a strong force of submarines. In the Pacific, we had 56 submarines, some of them extremely good. And their main goal was to defend the Philippine Islands with submarines. Well, they don't defend it very well. And the question would be, well, why didn't this work out? And the reason it doesn't work out is because of the probably, I believe, one of the largest scandals in U.S. military history, the Mark 14 torpedo. This is a, a disaster. That's the best way I can put it. Well, there's so many problems with the Mark 14 torpedo, but nobody really understands this for a significant amount of time. So the submarines go out, Philippines, all over, and they're not getting any, they're firing these things, and they're not getting any hits. Or what will happen is the thing, will they'll fire a torpedo, and they'll hear it blow up, and then the Japanese ship just keeps going. And they're like, they go back to Pearl Harbor or to Brisbane, and they go, you know, we there's a problem with these torpedoes, but the Bureau of Ordnance for the Navy says, no, there's no problem with this torpedo. The problem's you guys. You guys don't know what you're doing. You're not getting hits. Well, unfortunately, the Bureau is completely wrong because this torpedo has four major problems, which we will discuss. It runs too deep. Oh, by the way, these problems tend to mask each other too, which just makes this really drag on even longer. They have a gyroscope failure, to your point. So you fire a torpedo, and sometimes it comes back around and sinks you. Well, it's got a high-tech magnetic exploder, okay? <laughs> that doesn't work right. And then it's got a contact exploder, like any normal torpedo would have, and that doesn't work right. So why do these mask each other? Okay, we'll talk first about it runs too deep. It runs too deep for a couple of reasons. First reason is this torpedo is never, almost all these reasons actually, this torpedo is never properly tested. Why is it not tested? Because it's developed in like, start developing in 1930. And the government is stressed for cash in the middle of the depression. So the Navy doesn't have a lot of money. These torpedoes are expensive. At that time, they're $10,000 a piece. That's a lot of money. And so what they do is they put a dummy warhead for the tests and they make the torpedo buoyant. So if you fire the torpedo and then it'll float back to the surface, then you could pick it up and use it again. Makes sense. <laughs> Not a good way to test it. Then another thing, there's a hydrostatic uh, thing on the side of the torpedo that tells you the depth of the torpedo. Okay, Our previous torpedoes, this was mounted towards the front. On the early Mark 14s, it's mounted towards the back. Well, when you've got a torpedo going through the water, and this is a pretty high-speed torpedo. It's much faster than our previous models. There's a, like a, a vacuum effect. So it lowers the water pressure towards the rear of the torpedo. Well, how did they test it? Well, we tested it. We put it in a tank. Well, it's in a tank. It's not running. So they never, they don't realize that there's, there's less water pressure at the rear of the torpedo than there would be at the front. So finally, Admiral Lockwood, I'll give him credit. He uh, basically says, well, you know, we need to test these things. Something ain't right here. And he sets up a screen, a net at Pearl Harbor underwater, and they fire a bunch of torpedoes. And the torpedoes are all running 11 to 25 feet too deep. That's a problem. So they're going to fix that. Well, the uh, gyroscope problem, it's never 100% fixed, to be honest with you. Uh, there's still gyroscope problems even into 1944, but it's it's better. So I'm not going to go into great detail about that one. But let's talk about that magnetic fuse or pistol, as they call it. The idea of this thing is that a, a ship has a magnetic field. And if I hit the side of a ship with a torpedo 
and blow a hole in it. That's bad for the ship, but ships can be armored. They're, they build anti-torpedo bulges onto larger ships, and it's not going to necessarily give me as much damage as if I did something else. If I take a torpedo and make it run underneath the ship and blow up right underneath it, that water becomes like a hammer, and it'll break the keel of that ship. And that'll be a much more effective way to sink a ship than putting a hole in the side of it. Well, problem with magnetic exploders, and the Germans try this as well. They're not particularly effective because the magnetic field of the Earth is different in different places. And again, they don't test it. It's never tested under real conditions. So what's happening is sometimes the torpedo runs underneath doesn't sense it. Sometimes it gets close to the ship and blows up before it gets to the ship. So the Jap there, so our, our submarine captain's like, well, I heard it blow up, but then the ship just kept going. Well, the reason is, is it blew up, you know, 50 feet away from the ship. So that's a major problem. But the, the masking issue is, is they believe that the magnetic exploder is working okay, but the torpedoes are running too deep. That's not the problem. So again, fixing one problem, this pro other problem still exists. Then there's the contact exploder. Well, the contact exploder should work. Well, you know, it worked on the Mark 10 torpedo. Well, the problem with the Mark 10 torpedo is it's a lot slower than a Mark 14. Well, because the Mark 10 torpedo is so much slower, if you get a dead-on hit with this torpedo, right, a perfect 90-degree angle, bang, right, that contact pin crushes and when it crushes it pinches the exploder and so then it doesn't explode so there's literally japanese ships rock sailing around with a torpedo that bounces off or cargo ships have some of them actually it penetrates into the side of the ship and the ship just takes it back to harbor and i mean it, it's 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 a disaster and all along the bureau continues to fight the submarine commanders about this torpedo because they didn't build anything that was bad. It's your guy's fault. And one of the key players in this is an Admiral Christie. Now, Admiral Christie is in Brisbane, and he's one of the guys that helped develop the mark, uh, the uh, exploder, the, uh, the magnetic exploder. And he tells his submariners, you know what? I know this thing is good. I helped design it. You're going to keep using it. Well, what the submariners are going to do is they're going to leave port, they're going to open up their torpedoes, and they're going to turn that thing off. So, but again, you see even at a level of that, you know, combat commanders are still demanding things that just don't work right. So it just turns into a complete failure. It's not fixed until September of 1943. So basically we go through with two years of this nightmare uh and the japanese are literally laughing at us well let's talk about our submarines and our submarines are built for the pacific they have incredibly long range uh they have a lot of armament they have 10 torpedo tubes six in the front four in the back so you can fire a good size spread in either direction uh they are large they're not they're fast on the surface they're not particularly fast underwater uh, they don't, they dive pretty fast, not nearly as fast as a German submarine. Uh, they dive fairly deep, deeper than a Japanese, but again, not up to German standards. But again, you're fighting the Japanese in this case, and their anti-submarine warfare is not nearly as good. But our submarines are built for really long range and also to have crew comfort, comforts. We feel it's really important that submarines the crew of a submarine is in good condition, that indeed they're taken care of, that they're able to fight more effectively if they're treated properly. So our submarines have some incredible things that nobody else really does. For example, we have air conditioning. South Pacific, mighty damn hot in a submarine, and indeed ours are air conditioned. Our submarines have refrigerated food storage. So they can eat fresher, better food as time goes on. They have generous distilling capabilities. So they have fresh water. You could take a shower on a U.S. submarine. We also have washing machines. This is unheard of in other navies. I'll give you an example. I, I 
spent a lot of time with the U505 exhibit at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. And I'm pretty familiar with German submarines. And for example, on a German submarine, if you're at sea, about halfway through the voyage, they would let you turn your sheets over because they'd be fresher. Another thing about a U.S. sub is they almost have 100% of bunks for the crew. On a Japanese or a German submarine, you're hot bunking. So you've got eight hours on duty, eight hours you have your bunk. And then when you're on duty, someone else has your bunk. So again, not clean, not good food, not a lot of capability that U.S. submarines have. So it's really a much better lifestyle and again makes the cruise i believe much more effective because of the uh, i guess luxurious yes ellen if they were being volunteers did they get a premium pay for being submariners yes submariners got were not they were uh volunteers primarily and they did get a a, a, a higher rate of combat pay Yes, Jim. You might mention the movie Das Boot. What life was like on the German submarine? Great movie. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a great point. So, if you want to know what it was like to be on a German submarine, there's a movie called Das Boot. I would recommend it. It's very realistic. It's uh, it's not a happy movie. Let's put it that way. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it gives you an idea. I, I don't want to go into. I got. I don't have time. But if you want to ask me about submarines later on, feel free. I. I I know a lot more than I could discuss today. So remember I said we had really cautious commanders. Well, that's going to change. And one of the, probably the first great U.S. submarine commander is this gentleman, uh, Dudley Mush Morton. He is referred to as Mush because he is from the South. And at Annapolis, he's referred to as Mushmouth. So not particularly nice, but indeed, that's where he gets the name Mush. Well, Mush is going to be a prospective commander on the USS Wahoo, and he's going to be on this for their second war patrol. So what is, a, what is he? He's basically there to learn how to be a commander. And while he's on this patrol, it's not a good patrol. The captain of the ship, the uh, man named Kennedy, uh, has some opportunities to sink Japanese ships. He doesn't get aggressive. He doesn't go in. He doesn't do what he should do. And it brings down crew morale uh, and so much so that when they get back to Brisbane, Kennedy says, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't be in command of a submarine. He literally asks to be relieved of command. And they do that. And that what they're going to do is they're going to put Mush in command of the Wahoo for the next five war patrols. Well, Morton believes significantly that Japanese anti-submarine capabilities are way below ours, and, and we're making way too big a deal about Japanese anti-submarine capability. So we need to do what the Germans do, which I talked about, is go in on the surface as much as possible at night and go in, get in close, and get hits. And that's what he wants to do. He's got another advantage because he's this guy is going to be a great commander. He's got a combination. He decides that he has an executive officer named Richard O'Kane. And O'Kane and him make a team. So basically, Mush is on the periscope. Uh, O'Kane is on the TDC, the Torpedo Data Computer, which is, by our standards, is a calculator. But uh, uh, indeed, he runs the TDC. And they are become a disaster for the Japanese because they're just really good at it. Even with those crummy torpedoes, they're making a difference. Well, so Wahoo's going to go out on his third patrol, and O'Kane is, you know, there, and, and Mush is in command, and Mush tells the crew, he goes, you know what? The Wahoo is expendable, and if, if you don't want to look at it that way, then guess what? You can go to the yeoman and be asked to get taken off the submarine before we leave. Because he's going to go in close and he's going to be aggressive. And no one leaves. Because, again, they had bad morale because of Kennedy. So they finally leave uh, January 16th of 43. They go on their third war patrol. 
And they're going to go to a place called Weewalk Harbor, which is on the north coast of New Guinea. They don't give Mush any charts of the harbor because the idea is he's going to stay outside the harbor and just observe. Well, then one of the sailors buys an atlas in uh, uh, Australia, and it's got a little chart of Weewalk Harbor. And, you know, Marsh says, well, you know, why don't we do this? We'll just sail into the harbor and see if we can sink something. <laughs> and he does. Now he's in a harbor, he's underwater, but if you know, it's like this is confined and it's shallow, right? And he fires a spread of torpedoes at a, a merchant ship, doesn't get any hits. But the Japanese do notice this, and a Japanese destroyer begins to uh, come after him. Uh, they refer to that when it's coming right at you that it has a bone in its teeth. That's the wake. Okay. So he sees this just, and he's like, well, you know, we're in a pretty tough spot here. We're in the harbor. We can't really dive deep. We got really to go. So why don't we just keep firing torpedoes at it? So they fire a torpedo down the throat, misses. Fires a third torpedo down, a second torpedo down the throat, misses. Fires a third torpedo. Now this thing's getting close. Okay. And Fortunately for Mush and the Wahoo, our torpedoes leave awake because they're not oxygen powered, they're air powered. So they're leaving nitrogen bubble trail. The Japanese commander sees this one torpedo, this third one coming right at him. And he decides that he's going to make a little bit of a turn to try to avoid it. Well, what that does is, remember that contact exploder, it brings that torpedo in on an angle instead of flush hit, and that torpedo explodes. And you can see uh, through Mush's periscope here that the destroyer is sunk. And this is one of the most famous events in submarine history in the U.S., that Mush able to get a down-the-throat shot on a destroyer. So it's it's a, a pretty interesting. You can see this guy's pretty aggressive, okay? Well, two days later, they come up against a little convoy. And they get some hits, and they sink uh, particularly the Buyo Maru and the uh, uh, Fukai, Fukuai Maru, and they perhaps sink another ship of 4,000 tons, and they claim a tanker. Now, two of those ships are confirmed. The other two really are not. But there's a good possibility they did, sink the, they did not sink the tanker. So then... Remember, he's fired all these torpedoes. They're out of torpedoes. And they're heading kind of back towards uh, uh, Brisbane. And they come across another Japanese convoy. And one of the ships, a uh, uh, oiler, is kind of trailing the convoy. And they use their periscope, don't see any Japanese uh, escort ships. And Mush says, well, let's do this. Let's surface and we'll sink it with our cannon." Okay, so he surfaces, and they start shelling this freighter, this tanker, and all of a sudden, there is a Japanese uh, escort ship, and it's coming right at them, and at this point, Mush decides maybe the best idea here is to dive and, and get out of Dodge, but he sends a famous message to Pearl Harbor. He says, destroyer gunning, wahoo running. So, again, you see the difference here. All right, well, there's a dark side to Mush, though, unfortunately. And after sinking the Buyo Maru, he surfaces to recharge their batteries. Remember, these aren't nuclear submarines. They have a diesel engine that charges the batteries. They run on batteries underwater, diesel on the surface. So he sees lifeboats from the Buyo Maru, and he begins to get his crew on deck and using their anti-aircraft or machine guns to sink the lifeboats, which is against the Geneva Convention. What he doesn't realize is that this ship is carrying prisoners of war. And some of these people in lifeboats are from the 16th Punjab Regiment. And so 195 of these Indian POWs are killed and 87 Japanese are killed. Now, he doesn't kill everybody. He just sinks the lifeboats. But still, it's one of those, it's kind of almost, it's really tragic that this goes on, but that is kind of how Mush fought the war. Well, Wahoo makes seven total patrols. 
She sinks 20 Japanese ships for a total of 60,000 tons. On her seventh patrol, uh, the Wahoo is lost. The executive officer, Richard O'Kane, I've talked about. Before that seventh patrol, he is transferred to take command of a new U.S. submarine, which will be the Tang. The Tang will become the most successful U.S. submarine of World War II, sinking 33 ships for 116,000 tons. Unfortunately for O'Kane, he fires a torpedo at a Japanese ship. He gets a circular run. It comes back and sinks the Tang. Now, he was on deck. He was up on the conning tower because he was doing a night surface attack. And that's why him and six other people survived. They're captured by the Japanese and taken prisoner. So, again, you could see those circular torpedoes are a problem. Well, I, I would ask you to look at this picture. And the broom indicates that they have swept the ocean clean of Japanese ships. And the pennant reads... Shoot the sons of bitches. Okay, so you can see that Mush was a very, very uh, aggressive commander. Well, what I want to talk about next is called, uh, I call it the year of slaughter, which is 1944. Mush killed when the Wahoo was lost. Yes, everybody aboard was killed. And so, anyway, why do I call it? And, and, and the Information in this next part of the presentation comes from a gentleman, Richard B. Frank, who I recommend his books to you, uh, particularly two that are very famous. Uh, but regardless, I, they're on the syllabus. And he did some tremendous work here on quantifying losses of, of Japanese soldiers attributed to U.S. submarines. And what's going to occur in 44? So I would recommend him very highly. Uh, you got to realize that in 1943, in January, when we're fighting in Guadalcanal, we're fighting at uh, New Guinea, we're only fighting 6.5% of the Japanese army. The rest of the Japanese army, the vast majority of it is in China, which is why in this class I always stress to you that China is so incredibly important to keep into the war. And also the fact that the Japanese are starting to lose a lot at this point. By 44, there's some major problems for them. So they are starting to realize that they need to reinforce some of these islands. So they've got this thing called the Kwantung Army, and the Kwantung Army is in Manchuria, and they're there to fight perhaps the Russians. And it's one of the best armies they have. They're going to transfer 12 divisions from the Kwantung armies, that's about 22,000 to 24,000 men per division to these Pacific Islands in 44. And what that's going to do, though, it's going to place all these Japanese soldiers afloat. That's not going to work out well. Because the U.S. submarine fleet is vastly improved. We have now approximately 100 boats in the Pacific. They have now new aggressive commanders. They've fixed the torpedo problems. They have radar on every submarine. And again, how does that really help you? Like if you're going to do a night attack, I can stay out of visual range, use the radar to plot the enemy formation and get myself into better position. They can't see me. They have better sound sensors by now. Yes. The second paragraph. Oh. Quantum Army said that was facing the Soviets. There was no active combat at that time between those two. No, there was no active combat between the Soviets uh, and the uh, Kwantung Army until 1945, uh, when uh, uh, November they attack on November 9th. The Soviets do 1945. Yep. Remember the Japanese. And the Russians don't get along. They fought a major war in 1905. We have the big incident uh, in, uh, in, in uh, Mongolia in uh, 1939. The, the Japanese don't like the Russians. The Russians don't like the Japanese. So big force there. Gets weaker as time goes on. Well, anyway, uh, the 
boats, again, have superior radar, uh, but they also have another big advantage is we've increased our ability to break Japanese codes tremendously. A lot of this is attributed to women. Women have become very key to our code breaking efforts. We now know where Japanese ships approximately are going to be, which makes for a much more target rich environment. And indeed, that's going to be a huge advantage. Well, the Japanese know they've had some big losses in 43, and they're going to do everything they can uh, to make things better. So they begin to build more escort ships. They always had neglected this significantly. They try to make better sensors. They try to make better weapons. They still fall well, well behind where we are and where the, particularly the British are in this, these capabilities. But they're doing what they can to improve their anti-submarine warfare. Well, during 44, we're going to make 520 war patrols. We will sink 603 merchant ships, 2.7 million tons. Remember, they need to have 6 million tons. So their imports drop precipitously. In 42, they had 19.4 million tons of shipping imports. That's going to drop in uh, 44 down to 10 million tons. So they've lost almost 50%. They destroy numerous Imperial Japanese Navy warships. We sink nine cruisers. We sink a couple of carriers. We sink a battleship. And the Japanese perimeter, trying to reinforce this perimeter, trying to get more troops on these islands. That one year alone, they lose 79,004 Japanese soldiers are killed because of U.S. submarine attacks. Well, let's take a look at that in chart form. So if we look at this, we could see the chart on the left shows Japanese losses in five major Central Pacific battles, include the Marianas and Iwo Jima being the two largest. Total losses were 91,667 in those five battles for the Japanese. Our submarines account for, during the war, 97,342. So the submarines have really, really reduced Japanese combat power on all these islands. So that is going to make our ability to capture these islands that much easier, not to mention that they don't get the supplies they need. They don't have the ammunition. They don't have the concrete to build fortifications. Our submarines do a tremendous job making us able to capture islands in the Pacific. And you can see that in this chart. Like I said, one year... 79,004 Japanese soldiers die because of submarines. Yes, Alan? I eroded at this point the leadership of the Navy and the Japanese Army. Have they lost key personnel? Well, the, the Navy had Admiral Yamamoto shot down in 43, for example. But certainly there's, uh, I don't think the Army's had any major casualties like that, except for people that are just trapped or on islands. Uh, but I really can't quantify that for you, but I can I can tell you about Yam Yamamoto. So talk just real briefly about hell ships. Uh, hell ships were what the Japanese would do is they would take prisoners of war, they would take Ramusha, particularly from Indonesia, and they were in effect slave laborers, and they would pack them onto these horrible ships. They would just jam them in there, and they wouldn't feed them. They wouldn't give them sanitary conditions. Uh, they're basically slave ships. But they didn't mark them as such, that they were carrying non-combatants. So when our submarines and aircraft see these ships, they just assume they're just regular Japanese ships, and, of course, they will be attacked. And some of these attacks have tremendous uh, losses. For example, the Junyo Maru is carrying 2,200 POWs, about 4,200 Indonesian slaves, and it's going from Batavia to Sumatra. It's sunk by a British submarine, the uh, HMS Trade Winds, and the losses are just terrible. 1449 POW is killed, 4171 of the slaves are killed, and it's the worst single disaster in the Pacific War. Now, to give you an example, when I look at this little ship, it's 5,100 tons. It's carrying... 6,400 slaves, in effect. 
Now, when we look at the Queens, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth transporting U.S. soldiers to Britain, for example, these ships are packed. They've got 15,000 soldiers on those ships, but those ships are 80,000 tons. So you can only imagine how terrible the conditions had to have been for those people in the hold of that ship. Uh, it, it's really shameful, really. And uh, another example, uh, the Arisan Maru, it's carrying 1781 POWs. It's sunk, but it sinks really slowly. And all the POWs survive, and they refuse to pick them up. They just leave them out in the middle of the ocean, and only nine of those guys survive. So in World War II, POW losses on hell ships comes to a total of 15,744. Yes, Mr. Barber. Anybody tried in war crimes for those acts? Uh, yes, the people were tried for war crimes for hell ships. Were they convicted? Oh, yes. I don't think anybody got off. So, uh, all right, so when we look at submarine operations as a totality, so the Japanese, through World War II, lose 2,117 merchant ships. 113 of those are accounted for by submarines, or 52% tonnage. You can see they sank almost 5 million tons, or 60% of the total tonnage by submarines. Pretty incredible numbers. Japanese lose 611 warships. The sub sinks 201. They've managed to sink eight carriers and a battleship, amongst numerous other Japanese ships that they managed to sink. So they're effective against warships as well. And by the end of 43, quite honestly, the Japanese don't have enough merchant shipping to provide for their economy. It gets so bad. And we'll talk a little bit this about when I come about the battles of the Philippine Sea in a future class that they actually station their battleships and their carriers by the oil fields in Sumatra and in Borneo and in that area because they can't transport the fuel to keep it in Japan. So they literally have to station their ships in Southeast Asia in order to get oil. It gets so bad that they can't refine the oil. So they begin to take oil straight out of the ground and put it into their ships, which is really bad for the engines. And it's, it's amazing how much we are able to do with blockades. So example, by the 1945, our submarines only sink 156 ships. The reason they only sink 156 ships is because of two factors. One, there aren't a lot of left ships left to sink. And the second thing is because we're gonna have a different type of blockade of their islands. Well, Submarine losses are, are pretty bad. We have 288 submarines. Uh, we lose 52 in the war. The Japanese sink 42 of those submarines, and two of them are blamed on circular runs, probably more. But no one knows. They know for two for a fact, including, like I said, the Tang. Uh, 16,000 sailors go on war patrols out of those 375 officers and 3,131 enlisted men lose their lives. Yes, Bill. All those numbers for the Pacific Theater only? That's for the country. That's the whole thing. Including Germany, too. That's our submarines. Yeah, but we had... We had, we had losses. Of, yeah, we had losses in the Atlantic as well. Yes. They're in that number. They're in that number. So 22% loss rate. That is the largest loss rate of any U.S. military group in World War II. The German submarines had the largest percentage of losses of any unit in World War II. So you can see that being on a submarine is extremely dangerous and extremely uh, important, though, because for every one of our submariners lost, 28 Japanese soldiers died. And that means that when our Marines and when our soldiers land on these islands and try to take these islands, there's that much less fighting by those people. I always get a little sad with this picture because that's the Wahoo. And of course, the Wahoo is lost. And most of those people on the ship are, are this isn't actually they're leaving their last patrol. So it's leaving from Mare Island that had been repaired. But again, probably most of those people lost their lives. Was Mush Morton ever um, recognized for 
impact? Yes, Mush Morton was uh, the most famous submarine commander of his time until his loss. So he was certainly recognized. So he got the Navy Cross. I believe he at least got the Navy Cross. Uh, uh, O'Kane got the uh, Medal of Honor. Well, there's another aspect of War Plan Orange that's really not seen, and that is going to be destroying Japanese factories and their ability to wage war with air power. And of course, we see here the famous B-29 bomber dropping in tremendous amounts of, of bombs. And they will, of course, burn Japanese cities to the ground. They will drop the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But today, we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about another usage for this aircraft that is critical to blockade. Well, first thing we need to understand is that the B-29s were originally deployed in China. This is highly ineffective because all their supplies, all their fuel, everything they need has to be flown over the Himalayan mountains and delivered by air. That's not efficient. The Army Air Force has encouraged the Navy and the Joint Chiefs to, to capture the Marianas Islands. And the reason they want to do that, of course, is because they've got this new airplane, the B-29, that has incredibly long range. It can go, depending on how you load it, it can easily go 3,000 miles, 1,500 out, 1,500 back. And they know that the Marianas would be in range of the key cities of the Japanese, and they want to begin to use strategic bombardment. Part of the reason, of course, they want to use strategic bombardment to defeat the Japanese is they want to become an independent unit. They, they're, at this time, they're part of the army. It's the Army Air Force. They want to become the Air Force. And so they have a big goal. You, again, this is always this competition of wanting to be able to win the war using strategic bombers. Well, when we look at Japan, there's a couple pieces here. So at the top right, you can see how the U.S. submarines will get into the Sea of Japan. For example, the Wahoo is lost at the top arrow, uh, that's the La Perouse Straits. So you can see it's narrow, it's hard to get in there, and it's dangerous. But what's more important actually is the Shimonoseki Strait, which is down at the bottom or the middle there with the big black circle. That is the key entry port to a thing called the Inland Sea. It's very, very difficult to get submarines anywhere near there. As you can see, it's a confined area. There's air power. It's very, very dangerous. And mostly, they're not going to put submarines in there because it's just, it, it, you're going to lose too many submarines. It's impossible. But it would really be a good idea to block the Shimonoseki Straits and do something to that inland sea, as we'll see here. Remember, the Japan is all islands. The two most important islands are Honshu and Kyushu. The Inland Sea is the trade route between those islands. So the vast majority of shipping that goes on in between the islands is all done in the Inland Sea. So if you can damage the Inland Sea, if you can block the Inland Sea, you are really going to put a crimp in Japanese abilities. And indeed, the Navy has an idea. The Navy wants to use anti-ship mines dropped from B-29s. And you can see this picture. That's a mine being dropped from a B-29. And this, they, the Navy thinks this is a great idea. Remember, they always want to blockade, okay? Uh, so there's all these conflicting plans, though. So the Navy wants to blockade. The Army wants to invade Japan. And the reason being this. The Army feels it'll be too long a time after we defeat the Germans for us to wait for the Japanese to surrender, to admit to unconditional surrender, it's just by using blockade. So they think that the United States people won't put up with the war that long and we won't be able to achieve uh, unconditional surrender. So that is why the army under Marshall desperately wants to invade Japan and the war as quick as possible, force unconditional surrender. Well. What will happen then, of course, is this puts a strain on logistics. So we've got the Navy out there. We've got the Air Force bombing. And the Army wants to bring in approximately a million men 
in order to invade the Japanese home islands. And so all these strains on our logistics are going to limit the ability of the tasks of the Army Air Force. So there's only so much shipping to go around, even though we have 41 million tons. So it's also a change of priority. So if, if the Air Force is going to help the Army invade Japan, they need to knock out Japanese air power. So they need to destroy Japanese aircraft factories. They need to hit Japanese airfields, et cetera. If, they're, if blockade is the method we're going to use to defeat the Japanese, then what has to happen is they need to stop Japanese shipping. Again, you've got this problem. Well, when we look at the B-29, this is the single most expensive program that the United States does in World War II. It's about $3 billion. To give you an example, the atomic bomb is about $2 billion. So the AAF has decided that the B-29 is a war-winning weapon. They're going to do everything they can to make this thing successful. And their biggest idea is, is they want, of course, to be an independent Air Force. They want to be equal to the Army and the Navy because they believe in this. They believe in strategic bombardment. And if, if they can do that, they can knock Japan out of the war, it's going to make them that argument that much better. So if they can destroy the Japanese industrial capability, that's a huge goal. Want to do that. Well, the Navy has needs for this thing as well. They're like, well, look, we've got a lot of problems with kamikazes coming from, you know, attacking us at Okinawa. Could you help us out a little bit and try to hit some of the bases? And reluctantly, the Air Force will do that. Well, the Navy proposed that the B-29, again, to be used to drop these anti-shipping mines. And the B-29 is an effective range. It's 2,900 miles round trip to Shimonoseki Straits to Saipan. And the AAF says, we don't want to do that. We want to, we want to bomb cities. We want to knock out factories. We don't want to do this. And there's, there's this argument over this. I mean, you know, they don't, they don't want to do it. And, Admiral Nimitz is basically saying, hey, look, we need you guys to help us out. This would be a great idea. We got all the, we got these mines. We know they're going to work and help us out. Drop some mines for us. Well, finally, it dawns on the Army Air Force. Well, you know, it might be a good idea. This is a kind of another way we can show that we are strategic. We can use our planes to block seaports. And that's going to give us another argument why we should be an independent force. And so finally, they agree to start to do this. And there's two guys running the, the Air Force at, at the Marianas Islands. And one is uh, Haywood Hansel. He gets fired for being ineffective, kind of questionable. Uh, again, then they put in a guy you may be familiar with, Curtis LeMay. He ran for uh, vice president with a, a prominent Alabama politician. Uh, <laughs> so, and one thing about LeMay, he doesn't do anything halfway. Uh, I give him, he's an operator. And he sends a whole bombardment group on, this, on these missions. He's going to dedicate them. You can see this B-29 dropping mines here in this picture. And they're going to drop them at night. You don't need a lot of accuracy because you're just dropping them off a port, you're dropping them in the water, you can use radar, it's nighttime. There's not a lot of defensive, there's no anti-aircraft guns in the middle of the water. And they're gonna drop these mines and they can carry 13,000 pounds. So basically if you got a 2,000 pound mine, they can carry six, you got a thousand pound mine, they can carry 13. And they're gonna do this. And the mines themselves fall into three major types. There's magnetic mines that are, activated by the magnetic field of a ship passing over them. There's acoustic mines that are activated because of the noise of a ship. And then there's the most effective type is the pressure mine. The pressure mine is when the water pressure changes above a mine because of a ship passing, then it detonates. Now, how do you sweep these things? Magnetic mine, you create a magnetic field with wires. You sweep over it and it detonates the mines. Acoustic mines, you make noise in numerous ways. It detonates the mines. Pressure mines, 
not so easy to sweep. So how do we make our minds more effective? We decide, okay, well, the first time they pass over it, it doesn't detonate. The second time it doesn't detonate, et cetera. So maybe on the fifth time that a ship or they try to sweep it, then it will detonate. So you'll, they'll try to sweep these mines, but they're set so they don't detonate until a certain amount of times go by. And it's it makes them much, much more difficult to sweep. So they launched this on March 27th, 1945. And they send 92 aircraft. Three days later, they send 85 aircraft and they completely block the Shimonoseki Strait. Japanese are in a quandary. Uh, and they find that what they really a better idea is to send smaller groups of aircraft to these ports day after day after day. And that way, the Japanese are constantly forced to sweep mines. They actually have uh, people stationed on the, on the shore to look for B-29s dropping mines. Much more effective to keep dropping. Well, the effect of mining is not only about sinking ships, because ships are stuck in the harbor now because they're afraid of mines. They're not doing their job. They're not delivering goods. They're not picking up goods. They're not doing anything. They're just sitting in port. So that's a huge problem. Well, the campaign blocked the entrances to most of their repair facilities. 18 out of 21 of their major ship repairs are blocked. And B-29s fly 1,528 sorties. A sortie is an individual flight. Uh, they dropped 13,102 of these mines, and it's amazing how effective these things are going to be. And they could have dropped a lot more, but because of lack of planning, lack of logistics, they literally have run out of mines. Well, how successful this is is incredible. They managed to drop Japanese shipping. You can see in these numbers from before, 800,000 tons were getting in. As soon as the mines hit, it drops down to 250,000 tons. Uh, they blocked the port of Kobe, Osaka. It goes from 320,000 tons in March down to 44,000 tons in May. This is incredibly successful. And remember, the losses are incredibly low. There's not a lot of Japanese defenses over the ocean. Even in the inland sea, these ships, these our losses are incredibly low. So how effective does this really get to be? They sink 283 merchant ships. and they damage another 137. Japanese tonnage is just terrible. We lay a total in World War II of 25,000 mines, approximately. And the Navy says, okay, after the war, well, we'll try to help sweep these up. But after, I believe it's May of 46, they decide, well, we can't do this anymore. So, uh, you know, good luck. And what will happen is, is that it'll take 30 years to clean up all these mines. Occasionally, old mines still float up, not necessarily U.S. models. A lot of people put mines down. And you'll see them on a beach. They'll, have it, they'll be in the newspaper. And so the mine sweepers, to clean up all these mines, they lose or damage approximately another 500 ships over that 30-year period. So these are incredibly, incredibly effective, incredibly difficult to deal with. Well, Dan, I've always used this number, 6 million tons. We can see in this chart that the Japanese start out with 6,384. That's an index of 100. Uh, the first few weeks of the war, they lose a little few ships, not too much. They're still well over 6 million. 42 comes along. They lost a little bit, but still not bad. They still got basically 6 million tons there. Then comes 43. Now they're done a million and a half tons. Then comes 44. <laughs> they're down to 40% of their index. They cannot keep their factories going. They cannot feed their people. And of course, by 45, they're down to an index of 23. They only have a little less than a million and a half tons of shipping going into 1945. So much so, remember, Japan cannot feed itself. They need to import food. The Japanese people, by the time we take over the occupation, are literally starving to death. 
the, the estimate of calorie count in Tokyo at the end of 1945 into early 1946 is 1,000 calories per day. I can't live very well on that. Uh, to MacArthur's credit, remember, he's in charge of the occupation of Japan. The U.S. government doesn't really want to send food to the Japanese people. And MacArthur says, you know, look it. I'm prosecuting Japanese war criminals for starving POWs. And now we're going to not feed the Japanese people. This is just wrong. I, we can't do this. And to his credit, he gets the United States to begin to ship massive quantities of food into Japan in order to stave off, to keep them from starving to death. So you can see how huge blockade of Japan helped us to win the war and helped us to advance across the Pacific because of our submarines and our air power. And with that, I thank you all. Yes, question. Um, the one piece of this that you haven't talked about that I know you know <laughs> is the Dauntless Dive Bombers, which were so amazingly good Yes, in 42, were all taken out of service and put on the land and sank all of the Japanese transports, basically trying to reinforce those islands. Right, particularly Guadalcanal. Yeah, well, everywhere, they weren't super long range. No, short range, about 220 mile range out and back. Anytime the U.S. had an airfield within the range of those Dauntless dive bombers, they basically swept the ocean. Absolutely. And you were talking on your previous one about how the uh, destroyers are very ineffective in resupplying these troops. And the reason they were using them was because conventional ships were getting blown out of the water right. by short-range aircraft. Absolutely. The Douglas Dauntless, and particularly the Guadalcanal and in the Solomon Islands campaign, was incredibly effective. Japanese cargo ships couldn't get anywhere near their islands at that time because of the capabilities of our dive bombers. Unfortunately, the plane that replaced the Douglas Dauntless is called the Hell Diver, and that was really a crummy plane. I mean, so I don't want to go for yes, Mr. Sherlane. Tito was carried by that plane, the dog. Didn't carry torpedoes. Dive bomber. Oh, the dive bomber. Dive bomber. Oh. Yes. Can't help but think about the news just recently that we're going to be sharing nuclear submarine technology with the Australians in order to um, gum up the South China Sea, if, you know, down the road. I mean, history history is very much alive, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. There's, uh, And we'll get to that in, in great detail in the last class when I talk about China. But, uh, yeah, uh, I, I believe it's the French had a deal to sell submarines to the uh, to the uh, uh, Australians, and now the French are really mad at us because we're going to sell them uh, nuclear technology and give them better. They were going to buy conventional, uh, uh, they're not diesel electric anymore, but conventionally powered, non-nuclear powered submarines. And the French are really pissed. Okay. Yes. Uh, what about the difference or the advantage advantages of the Hellcat over the Wildcat? Oh, well, uh, okay. Uh, I'll try to make this brief. The Wildcat is a pre-World War II fighter. Okay. Uh, it is powered by a 1,200 horsepower engine. Uh, it is a sturdy plane. Uh, it is, if you can get above the Japanese and dive on them, it's not particularly maneuverable. It doesn't have particularly long range, but it's a good sturdy aircraft. It brings its pilots home, and it's pretty well armed. Some people would say over armed, uh, with six instead of four 50 caliber machine guns. Another argument there. Uh, certainly the Hellcat, which is a replacement for that for the Wildcat, is and we I will talk about this plane in a little more detail in a pre in a, in a future class. But uh, that aircraft uh, is much faster. It has a 2,000 horsepower engine. It uh, has uh, much more maneuverability. It can outclimb a zero at high altitude. It can outmaneuver a zero. Uh, and I believe as far as U.S. aircraft go, it was the most successful aircraft in kill ratio in the United States uh, a, a Navy or Army. I believe they 
credit that one aircraft with shooting down 5,000 aircraft. So there you go. All right. Well, again, thank you all for coming. I hope to see you next week. Oh, got done early. Yes. Uh,